All right, welcome everyone. The chat has been enabled. Good morning. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, no matter where you're coming from, I hope you're having a good day. Uh, so welcome to today's session. This is session six and today's topic is estimating the costs of health and health system impacts of climate change. So just to go over some uh, ground rules and housekeeping. So hopefully you're used to this by now, but for if anyone's joining for the first time, we have live interpretation in English, Spanish, and French. And to activate this, uh, select the circle globe icon at the bottom of the screen and select your desired language. So just to remind everyone, this is a nine session course and we have classes every Tuesday and Thursday uh, at this time for an hour and a half. Um, today is session six, so we're officially past the halfway point of the course. And today's session is on estimating the costs of health and health system impacts of climate change. Uh, next week on Tuesday, we'll have our session seven and the topic of that session will be opportunities and guidance for lowering the carbon footprint of health systems. So be sure to tune in for that as well. Just to keep everyone in the loop as always, so we collect your attendance automatically. Um, if you use the link that you got when you registered, uh, we automatically collect your attendance. In terms of logistics, um, yeah, this today's session, like all the others, is 90 minutes. Um, and at the end, we will have a question and answer section. Uh, so please be sure to add your questions for the presenters in the Q&A box. Um, and then we also record these sessions in the three languages and we'll be posting those on the course website. So be sure to stay active on the course website for all the materials um, as all the slide decks and the learning objectives are all available on the website as well. So for today's session, we have four great speakers. Um, we'll be starting off with Andrea Bassi, uh, he's from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, or IISD. Uh, then we'll have Diego Moreno Heredia. He's coming from the Colombian Ministry of Health and Social Protection in the Division for Climate Change and Health, uh, followed by Marcus Sarafem. Uh, he's a PhD senior environmental scientist, and he's at the United States Environmental Protection Agency in the Climate Change Division. And then we'll finish off with Montira Pongsiri, um, she's a senior advisor for climate change and health at Save the Children. Um, so our first speaker uh, will be Andrea Bassi, and he is the founder and CEO of Knowledge SRL and a senior associate at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, he has over 15 years of experience working with governments and international organizations on the development of customized models for the assessment of outcomes of policy and investment across social, economic, and environmental indicators. Um, so Andrea has specific expertise in green economy strategies and scenarios, climate mitigation and adaptation, industrial competitiveness, and more generally in sustainable development. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Andrea. You can go ahead and share your screen with the presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amber, for the introduction. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present today at the course. Uh, as highlighted in, in my experience, I normally work on systems analysis. So I like to connect the dots between social, economic, and environmental indicators. And my presentation today focuses on that, is on estimating the cost of climate change on health and health systems, and also estimating the co-benefits of climate action. So if we, if we get started and look at the context, we know already that climate change has a lot of impacts on the health system and on human health. So here on the right side, you see more of a cascading effect of climate change. It affects a number of different areas or components of the system going from ocean acidification to air pollutants to temperature, which goes on to affect rainfall patterns, sea level rise, extreme weather events. And these manifest themselves as heat waves, droughts, fires, floods, and so on and so forth, which if we go further down in the image, 
we see will have an impact on nutrition, on mental health, on cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases, and so on and so forth. So we, we have to figure out what is the chain of causality that takes climate change as a global phenomenon down to biophysical impacts and all the way then to health-related impacts for human beings, for us in general. Now, we know if you look at forecasts, and this is from the fifth report of the IPCC, that these impacts are going to get stronger in the future. So if we have warming, 1.5 degrees Celsius warming in the next decades, then we see the impact that will increase mostly for nutrition, for heat, for food and waterborne related infections. So in general, we see growing incidence, growing costs related to the impacts of climate change on health, and as a result, growing consequences for overall well-being, including social indicators, economic indicators, and the extent to which we can enjoy ecosystems and related ecosystem services. Now, that being said, we already have now important costs. So if we look at some of the statistics of the impacts of climate change on, on human health, just the exposure to air pollution uh, is reflected in about 7% of global GDP in terms of total cost, 5.11 trillions. And this is using data from a couple of years ago. So now that impact will be even larger. If you look at the financial cost of health impacts overall in 15 countries, again, air pollution ranges around 4% of GDP. Now we see that the impact is quite important, quite sizable. Uh, whether we look at the global estimate or country-specific estimates. But then what is even more important in my view, if you look at the last bullet point in this slide, is that if we intervene to reduce such impacts, the benefit to cost ratio is positive. So in a way, we see from a multitude of studies that we get more in return than what we invest because of the important avoided costs that these investments will generate. So this is, in a way, the, the background or the, the reason why I was asked to work on a framework that supports the quantification, the economic valuation of the health outcomes that originate from health and non-health climate change mitigation and adaptation action. So here we are looking at not so much quantifying the impacts of climate change on health, but mostly figuring out what is the value of the health and non-health co-benefits of acting for climate change on both mitigation, so emission reduction, and adaptation. So this is important because if we want to realize these benefits and avoid a large part, we could say, of these uh, negative economic impacts that climate changes on human health and the health systems, then we need to start figuring out how we can connect our actions to the reduction of these costs or to the co-benefits. Now, here we see a few examples in this slide and why we need this framework and how can we use it. Uh, for instance, if you look at the center, we have an image uh, that or text that describes what happens if we plant trees in cities. If we do that for climate mitigation, for reducing emissions, then we're going to increase carbon sequestration. So we reach that immediate goal. But then planting trees gives us improved air quality. It reduces air temperature and potentially the heat island effect. And so these two co-benefits of improved air quality and reduced temperature will have positive impacts on human health, reduce costs related to higher temperature in the future and related to extreme events. They also, if you look at other examples, if you invest in renewable energy, still to reduce emissions, go on to create jobs, while at the same time reduce impacts of air pollution. If we change topic, if we go from mitigation to adaptation, if we want to invest in health facilities, then we can see that potentially we reduce the negative impact of power outages, which may be caused again by extreme events. If we make health facilities more climate resilient, we avoid having uh, interruptions in basic infrastructure services like power supply. Same if we go into agriculture for climate adaptation, we may increase land productivity, so we have an economic benefit. At the same time, we avoid losses that would emerge from say extreme events like droughts or floods. And we have the extra benefit of avoiding the impacts related to malnutrition. So we produce more, maybe more nutritious food because we produce in a more sustainable way. And that is a positive co-benefit related to nutrition. Now, why do we need this type of framework? Because in general, first, it sets the stage for the creation of a systemic assessment that reflects how reality works. 
So we know that in reality, we have several factors, social, economic, environmental, that are interconnected with one another. We cannot take all health in isolation in the same way as we cannot take all climate mitigation or adaptation in isolation. We have to connect the dots and see what are the causes, what are the effects, and therefore how we can leverage our investments and create core benefits, basically increase the value for money for the investments we implement. Second, we perform knowledge integration so that we are going to work together with those that focus on health economics, those that work on policy assessment for climate mitigation, for adaptation, but for development or for sustainable development more in general. Be it at the national level, at the local level, landscape level, it doesn't matter. That integration is largely missing at this stage. Then is a third point because it connects policy making across sectors. And in a way, it highlights, in my view, how health is at the center of development or should be at the center of development, because we need an economy that supports well-being, including human health. We don't have the opposite that we have to realize. We don't have to work to generate economic growth. No, growth has to be something that is conducive to improving our well-being. And then fourth, because it does lead to considerable gains. Uh, both on the outside, but also on the economic estimation of these health gains. And so overall, it leads to a more sustainable future, especially if we take into account that most governments are already pretty stressed under pressure when it comes to fiscal balances, meaning that deficits are very high and climate change, when it comes in, it generates an extra issue. And so the only solution we have is, yes, to stimulate growth, but at the same time, even more effective would be to reduce costs to reduce the cost of economic growth. And this linking health and climate change offers that synergy. So how does this work in practice? If you look at the top of this image, we have the scientific approach. The scientific approach normally focuses on estimating the impacts of climate change on health. So if you have a scenario of inaction, we say we do nothing, we look at what happens when the temperature increases, when we have more extreme events, rainfall and extreme heat and so on and so forth, now let's see what is the consequence for human health. So we do climate change modeling, we look at impacts, we do health effects modeling, we estimate morbidity and mortality impacts, and then we figure out what is the actual cost. So we do an economic valuation of morbidity and mortality. But this is in a way disconnected from policy. So we need to start looking forward on the policy level and figure out what are these scenarios to consider, meaning what are the goals for development that we want to achieve. And this is where we add these desired policy targets you see at the center of the image. Then we move on and say, when we consider these investments, these intervention options to realize scenarios, what happens if we work towards health action? Then we can do impact modeling with an impact due to action. This is in section 2.1 or input 2.1. And then we go on to figure out what are the costs and benefits of addressing health concerns. But then we have to go an extra step to do a proper systemic analysis. We have to see what is the impact now that we know the consequences of climate change, the effectiveness of health-related action, of implementing policies in other sectors so that we can create core benefits with health. And this is assessment number three at the bottom. So in a way, in order to properly address the interconnections across health and climate change, including policy action to address climate change, we need to go through all these different steps and make sure so that we have all this information available to policymakers to then lead to these changes in climate and health policy. Now, the implementation is different from what I just described now. That was more of a framework to figure out how things can be done, but implementation is a bit different. So here we need to start thinking about how climate change, society, economy, environment, and policy come together to generate a specific health impact. So the question really is that we see at the bottom, how does climate change affect health? That, that's very straightforward. And we are again at the, at the first layer that we saw in the previous uh, image, previous diagram. But then we need to move ahead and say, what indicators do we use to quantify such impacts? And so here we start selecting indicators that are health related, but also not directly connected to health. We can look at biophysical indicators, look at climate-related indicators on temperature. We can see exposure of people to high temperature in urban areas as opposed to rural areas, impacts on labor productivity as opposed to impacts on other types of diseases, and so on and so forth. And then once we know what are the indicators that we need, we can start thinking about how to quantify. So we move to models. And with the models, we have two main questions. 
what is the physical impact, and then what is the economic impact. So that in the end, we can do a societal economic valuation of the impacts of these investments. So avoided costs, added benefits resulting from the implementation of the investments. And this is information we need to then make the case for action. Because if you make the case for action for climate mitigation, for reducing emissions, of course, the case will be more compelling if you look at the avoided cost of air pollution or the avoided cost of extreme heat and so on and so forth. But that is actually what happens in reality. So we don't want to miss the opportunity of presenting this information to decision makers that normally have a limited attention time span. So if you look at the implementation steps, then even more practically, we have here the exploration of development impacts on health, accessing these climate change impacts on health, identifying intervention options, what do we want to do, select relevant indicators, and then looking at models, methods and models we can apply. There is an argument for calibrating, parameterizing the models, maybe even customizing them to make so that they fully reflect the local context. Because as soon as we add some of the social and environmental considerations on top of climate and economic considerations, then we need to personalize the analysis to make it more relevant. But overall, once you have implemented these steps, we have a few different ways to summarize the information. The first one is to carry out a cost-benefit analysis, which basically tells us if the investment is economically viable, if it makes sense from an economic point of view to make such investment, including or excluding these health and non-health co-benefits, or say externalities for the project implementers. Then the second method is cost-effectiveness analysis. This is basically a way of assessing what is the most productive or cost-effective way to achieve a given goal. So in this case, we would take into account options that are not economically viable, while normally with a cost-benefit analysis, we tend to exclude what is not viable, what cannot pay for itself in a way. But then since we know that not all the indicators can be quantified and quantified with confidence, we also carry out often multi-criteria analysis, where we have some of these indicators that are more qualitative in nature, that are assessed, let's say, from a scale from one to five, so that we can combine with multi-criteria analysis the hard, say, quantified CBA and CEA assessments together with a more uh, context-informed, let's say, qualitative analysis. Now, this framework has been pilot tested on six different assessments or six different case studies. Um, I have to apologize, I cannot share the full document that describes the framework and all these uh, pilot cases because the study will be released in two weeks from now, but we'll be very happy to follow up and share the link and even the invitation to the online event for the release of the framework that has been co-developed uh, with WHO and ISD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development. So here are the options we looked at in case they're of interest to you. Climate smart agricultural practices that can support adaptation and create considerable co-benefits for nutrition. Planting trees for two different purposes, one for flood mitigation and the other one for heat mitigation with the same underlying goal of carbon sequestration and so climate mitigation and then adaptation. Improved building design to address issues related to vector borne diseases and then improving energy efficiency, renewable energy and fuel switching to improve human health from the point of view of pollution, air pollution primarily, indoor and outdoor air pollution. And then finally, we have climate proofing of health facilities that addresses both mitigation, the efficiency improvements, but also adaptation so that we can improve facility operations and reduce mortality in case of extreme events. So I want to show you just a couple of cases to give an idea of how this can be turned into practice. And if you look at planting trees, second case study, with the goal of basically increasing carbon sequestration while at the same time with health co benefits, we reduce flood uh, risk. We have basically an issue that is driven by the fact that land clearing is normally extensive in urban areas. And that has led to the reduction of what we called adaptive capacity, meaning that we have more exposure to climate change impacts and flood, more damage can be created, and we have little capacity to adapt. And so what we want to do in this case is to introduce tree planting to make so that we can reduce the amount of water, the storm water runoff that we'll find in the urban area because trees will take up, sequester, use water, slow down the speed of a storm water runoff, and therefore reduce the potential damage that we see um, happening on the ground. 
Now, the indicators that we were able to quantify in these cases, the investment required for tree planting, avoided costs from flooding, avoided mortality and the impacts on human health, malnutrition, waterborne diseases, loss of property, so loss of value of assets. And we use spatial models in this case to carry out the analysis. So this a fairly complex representation is uh, what we have created. So we have on the left side a land cover map. We are looking at the city of Islamabad in this case. And on the right side, we see land cover classes. In green, we have green spaces and trees. In red, opposite end, we have urban areas with no green spaces. So what we did is to transition from the image of the center to the image on the right. You see there is a lot more green spots in this image on the right, and the net impact where these green areas are being added are here represented in the map at the bottom. And so this highlights where trees could be planted to make so that we can reduce the impact of floods, basically. Uh, different strategies could be used. Trees could be planted outside the city or inside the city, inside the urban area. This is mostly on the outside to make sure that we have less of the water flowing in to the city center. Now, in this case, we see that there is a 12% increase in water retention because of the tree planting investment. Uh, and we have a, a total investment of $6.5 million, but we generate total avoided costs in the range of $57 million. Some for flooding, close to 40, and then 18.5 roughly from the about the cost of extreme events, so impacts on property and so on and so forth. So overall, we see that we have a positive impact and there is an investment that is economically viable. Of course, the more is the risk of climate change going forward, the more will be the value generated or the avoided costs accrued as a result of this investment in nature-based infrastructure for the city. Now, the second example I want to show Excuse you- Excuse me, Andrea, five think, more minutes. Yes. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. The second example I want to mention is the climate proofing of health facilities. And so we move from a landscape to an asset, to a specific building in this case. So we know that infrastructure is vulnerable to climate change and often it's not designed to withstand extreme climatic events, extreme wind or rainfall and so on. We see that there is an increase in frequency and severity of some of the extreme events in several parts of the world. And what we have considered in this case was retrofitting known structural items. So we use passive and active design to make so that we allow better water flow, better airflow, better insulation at the same time. And at the same time, we work on hard infrastructure for, for instance, undergrounding uh, power distribution lines so that they are less vulnerable to external events. And then we introduce solar PV as a way of becoming more independent. In, uh, in the way in which electricity can be generated and then used. Uh, similar to the analysis I mentioned before, we are able to estimate a variety of indicators. We have the total investment and then total avoided cost, net present value, and then the internal rate of return and the benefit to cost ratio, plus the payback period in terms of number of years required to pay back the investment. And here between the top and the bottom part of the table, we have distinct, we have created a distinction between what is peculiar to health facilities. So you can see with the asterisk on the left side, in this case where you see the asterisk, we have considered the avoided cost of power outages, meaning the risk that all the equipment that we have in the health facility stops working, whether it's for a minute or five minutes if you have a generator, diesel generator on site, or even longer if you don't have a local generation on site. And then here at the bottom, what would be the impact for a conventional building where we don't have patients that need treatment? And so let's look at the example of solar PV and battery storage, where you have the first blue arrow. In this case, if we consider the reality of a health facility, investing in solar PV and batteries as an IRR, internal rate of return, of 113%. We generate $11.2 for each dollar invested. We pay back the investment in one year if we can price, put an economic price on the value of the patients that are not impacted by an extreme event. On a conventional building with the costs that we're estimating $15 million to equip a hospital-sized um, building, then we only have $13.8 million in avoided cost, and we are not actually able to pay back the investment. And so this highlights how different the analysis has to be for climate mitigation and adaptation, health co-benefits for health facilities as opposed to other buildings. 
So what we've learned in general is that knowledge integration is not easy. Uh, we need to perform it to make so that we have that more systemic view. We have a more truthful representation of the impacts of investments that can reduce climate change impacts on health. Without that knowledge integration, it's extremely difficult to have that objective analysis being carried out. We need, of course, to validate the data. We need to check the assumptions across different domains to make sure that everything matches, that everything is consistent. And at the same time, we need to allow for the reproduction of the analysis by other experts to make so that also the assumptions can be validated and can be cross-checked. Recommendations that emerge from these lessons learned that we need to conceptualize the exercise well. We need to understand whether the analysis of the health co benefits is required to complement an analysis already available or whether it's done for an exploratory purpose to shed light on new outcomes that maybe were never assessed. Then we need to search for historical data and test the validity of these data, knowing that there will be more variability in climate impacts and so higher health costs in the future. So here, historical data are useful, but we need to do a forward-looking analysis always. And then we need to do proper validation of models to make so that we're able to compare the results that would emerge when you do a sectoral analysis in isolation, as opposed to an interconnected analysis that looks at different domains, different policy domains. Now, one critical challenge that I guess you're aware of is the economic valuation of these health care benefits using mortality, morbidity, statistical value of life. Many stakeholders will say these are intangible costs. We need to know the cost of delivering support or health services to a patient. Both have their own space in the analysis. So there is no set approach. We need to use the approach that resonates better with other stakeholders that we are dealing with or with our audience. But normally the approach would be to say, look at both estimations and then use them as needed. Then one last point on uncertainty. We know that we need to rely on local data as much as possible, but then uncertainty is always present. And so the idea would always to perform sensitivity analysis to see, in fact, what may be the outcomes if we use different assumptions? What would be the threshold that would make the investment not economically viable? So this is the type of information that can provide extra useful input to policymakers when deciding how to address that interconnection between climate change and health. So thank you for your attention. Here you find email addresses if you want to reach out to me, Andrea Bassi, or to colleagues at the WHO, the World Health Organization. And again, in two weeks, there will be the release of the report and we'll be very happy to receive your inputs and comments and suggestions on how to make it stronger. And of course, if you want to apply this framework, you'll be more than welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. It's a really great presentation, very interesting. Um, so now I'll pass it on to uh, Diego Moreno Heredia. And so Diego is a biologist He's a specialist in environmental law and a candidate for a master's degree in public health. He's also the coordinator of the Healthy Territory and the climate change leader of the Ministry of Health and Social Protection in Colombia with 12 years of experience in climate change and health issues. Um, so without further ado, uh, Diego, please go ahead. Thanks very much. Anwar, muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Anwar. Thank you so much, everyone, PAHO, Columbia University, and all of the organizers for the invitation. I'm going to do my presentation in Spanish, but you will see that some of the slides contain information in English because they were taken from the original report that was published in PAHO's website. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Great. So can you tell me if you can see it in full screen? Well, so now today I'm going to tell you about a report 
that we created um, created by the WHO and PAHO who supported the Ministry of the Environment and Sustainable Development of our country. And this, uh, re this report was issued on the benefits or co-benefits to health and also the economic benefits of the for this investment that was proposed in Colombia. I'm going to quickly go over the objective, the methodology that we use, the results um, briefly. And finally, I'm going to close with some policy recommendations that you can also find in the report. So as an introduction, briefly, I wanted to mention that this is, of course, derived from the commitments undertaken by the country as a member of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that all of you, of course, know well that was uh, first started with the Kyoto Protocol, and now we have the Paris Agreement uh, from 2015. And it stated that there should be some national, nationally determined contributions for mitigation and adaptation so that um, we can have a, a climate uh, ambition. We need to, to show how we are going to achieve resilience to climate change in different areas. In Colombia, we have already published the third communication on climate change. We have a national climate change policy and a law uh, that enables um, the creation of climate change plans by area and by territory for the different departments um, that our country is divided into. In December 2020, the nationally determined contributions, the, the goals for the for health for the nationally determined contributions were published in December 2020. And it's important to mention that they include two adaptation goals that are specific for the health sector. Currently, our country has a, a climate action law in force that includes the NDC goals, but they were um, the fact that they were set as a law it kind of gives them more force for enforcement and compliance. Um, so what are the NDCs? Well, basically, are the, the core of the Paris Agreement. And it um, mandates the countries to establish um, some communications about how they're going to um, create this adaptation and mitigation. They have a 2030 compliance um, timeframe. And so the country has the commitment to reduce emissions and thus strengthen its resilience. As I was mentioned, these goals are updated every five years, and then some actions, projects, or, or plans are specifically created to achieve those goals. So the main thing about this NDCs is that they are also seek to raise our ambitions um, in each each time. So now going specifically into our study, the objective was to estimate the health and economic benefits of mitigation scenarios proposed in Colombian NDCs. There was a big team of experts and specialists working on this from WHO, PAHO, 
the Clean Air Institute, the Stockholm Environment Institute, and also from our country, we had the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development and uh, myself for the Ministry of Health and Social Protection. Now, very generally, the methodology that we used, we used three tools, basically carbon age, which uh, allows us to calculate the benefits um, for health of reducing emissions and the um, expected uh, effects on health, reducing mortality and morbidity and the economic benefits caused by those savings. So by reducing the, the emissions, by the year 2030, by some specific policy actions that are established in the NDCs in, in Article 2 of that framework convention, in a way, uh, we have benefits for health. So as I was saying we use three tools to estimate those benefits. The first one is was LEAP. LEAP is a low emissions analysis platform. Uh, that's the acronym. And what it does is from the um, greenhouse gas emissions evaluations, it quantifies the reductions uh, caused by each of the mitigation measures considered in the NDCs. And this LEAP software also has a module that is known as um, Integrated Benefits Calculator or IBC that is used to quantify the impact of the changes in emissions in uh, atmospheric contaminants uh, in the reduction of the exposure that the people have to those uh, pollutants and its effects on health. So these are um, very specific uh, statistical uh, characteristics that I'm not going to go into detail, but basically it um, takes into account mean concentrations. Um, this was done for Colombia in particular, but there are some technical considerations and uh, I will let you know which reports you can read to go further into this. And then finally, carbon age, which was the tool that we use to for health results uh, for avoided mortality and avoided premature mortality based on some reference scenarios and some proposed mitigation scenarios. And also it allows us to calculate the costs uh, related to those scenarios that can be reduced. So we use those tools because they are flexible. They um, can be adapted to our the co context in Colombia. And so this chart, um, you have five minutes. Um, yes, great. And in this chart, we can see that uh, one of the people in charge created this and we can see the inputs and then we can define those inputs in the model and do the impact pathway analysis using demographic information, concentrations of pollutants, yearly mortality and morbidity rates for some specific 
events and some economic and financial information that has to do with the cost for hospitals, productivity loss, and others. So finally, regarding the results, uh, the study results indicate that by 2030, uh, before that, there are three scenarios. When the first of them, business as usual, uh, and without any mitigation actions by 2030. Also, so that's scenario number one. Scenario number two, an emission reduction. And scenario three, which is much more ambitious. Here you can see the expected reductions considering the comparison, the comparison between scenarios two and three, which are more ambitious. Therefore, the expected reduction is much higher uh, uh, for different for these different contaminants, methane, particulate matter, etc. Um, black carbon as well. So finally, it has been estimated the uh, 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 that avoiding morbidity and premature mortality and economic costs in scenario three is 20% higher than the costs in scenario one, if nothing happened, if we had uh, inaction. And uh, avoided mortality has to do with uh, chronic uh, asthma and chronic bronchitis in children. Avoided hospital admissions amounted to 2,750 cases. Also avoided episodes of childhood chronic bronchitis account for less than 1% of the total morbidity benefit. We need to remember that reducing GAG emissions could prevent approximately approximately 3,800 deaths per year um, by 2030. These charts show us specific health events and which are the cases that were avoided in thousands of cases. Um, Policy recommendations. These were the policy recommendations um, that resulted from the study. And after this estimation, we suggest that uh, climate change mitigation actions become more ambitious in different sectors, transport, agriculture, etc., because this saves lives and reduces the burden of disease. Also, health should be at the core of the countries and DCs uh, following uh, WHO guidelines and also current studies uh, on the subject. We should adopt a health approach in all policies, especially in uh, large emitting sectors such as energy, transport, and agriculture. We should create mechanisms to facilitate the cooperation between health and other health determinant sectors. And finally, we should continue implementing research projects like this that will allow us to have uh, reliable data about health benefits and on health and also the, the economic benefits um, so that we can um, influence public policy making. I would like to thank the entire team that has coordinated the WHO PAHO project. We also have the experts in modeling, uh, thanks especially to Dr. Joseph Spadaro. And we also have the team from the Ministry of Health and Social Protection, Ministry of the Environment and Sustainable Development, uh, Clean Air Institute, and of course, WHO and PAHO. So thank you so much. And please let me know if you have any questions. This is uh, the the web the, the link uh, where you can download the report, and of course we we can share with you this presentation, or you can write to us on the emails that appear on the screen. We work at the Ministry of Health, and we supported this major project. Thank you very much. Se van a hacer las las preguntas. And I don't know if we're going to have questions now or later on. Gracias, Diego. Sí, estamos poniendo ahora... Thank you, Diego. 
Yes, we're compiling the questions uh, from Zoom. Exactamente, la primera es, es verdadera. Firmaba en well, number one is true. The carbon age tool estimates health and economic benefits. That's true. And question, that's question number one. Question number two. Especially for Colombia. And uh, the estimation, I'm sorry, the presentation was so fast. Um, but this was done according to these, this uh, scenario. So the, the largest uh, percentage of uh, prevented mobility, mobility had to do with one event in particular, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma and bronchitis and COVID-19. Sí, estuvieron muy distribuidos, pues okay. todos. Okay, the, the results are varied uh, because in a way, every condition has to do with air contaminants and air quality, but the highest percentage, 53%, actually reflects the right answer. Asthma and bronchitis in children. This condition had the, higher, uh, the highest avoided mobility rate. Thank you again for the invitation. Diego. Thank you, Diego, for this excellent presentation. This was a very interesting Colombian project. Our next guest speaker. So I'll be introducing uh, Marcus Sarafem, and he is a senior environmental scientist in the United States Environmental Protection Agency in the Climate Change Division. Um, he is been there for 15 years and after receiving his PhD from MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change, uh, he now works on climate change, providing expertise to policymakers working on climate communication and publishing original research. All right, Dr. Sarafim, uh, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, talk to this audience. Um, so I will also be talking uh, like the other speakers about climate health and economics. Uh, one thing is uh, I will be concentrating on the direct effects of climate. So the previous two speakers, uh, part of their uh, discussion was about the important co-benefits of, for example, reductions in air pollution emissions that result when you control greenhouse gas emissions. I won't be talking about that. I'll only be looking at the, the direct economic effects. And then uh, my other caveat is that coming from the US Environmental Protection Agency, a lot of my work uh, and the resources I'm familiar with uh, are um, concentrated on impacts within the United States, but I think these results are uh, relevant for uh, participants from any country. So I wanted to start with the big picture before I present one specific analysis that we've worked on. So uh, how do you get from climate change to health impacts? So at the, the global scale, uh, we have increased greenhouse gas concentrations lead to increased temperatures, which change weather patterns, precipitation, uh, extreme weather and sea level rise. Uh, but these sort of large scale uh, changes are not what people experience. So we need to think about what humans are being exposed to. And so humans can be exposed to uh, extreme heat events in their local area, uh, changes in air quality, uh, changes in uh, food and water quality, uh, 
I noticed a number of questions in the chat were about uh, vector-borne diseases. So there are changes in, in those. Um, and then these changes in exposure uh, are then lead to the actual health impacts. So um, your change in extreme heat events in your local area uh, can lead to um, cardiovascular events or uh, uh, hyperthermia if uh, you know you as an individual don't have access to air conditioning. Um, similarly, uh, with changes in the the uh, uh, vector-borne diseases, whether or not your area is going to become uh, more hospitable to uh, certain kinds of mosquitoes, uh, you actually then need to have the mosquitoes uh, and not control them with various um, control techniques, uh, not have uh, bed nets at night, other things in order to then become infected with the vector-borne disease. Uh, so that's sort of this center column, the drivers to the exposure pathways, the health outcomes. Um, but this is modified um, by uh, the environment and institutional context. I mentioned things like infrastructure, air conditioning, um, local uh, choices about urban design lead to heat islands. Um, on the uh, right side, we have social and uh, context. So certain individuals can be more vulnerable uh, because they're very old or because they're very young and can't move. This is why, you know, every year we see tragic instances of uh, children locked in a car who have heat events. Um, that's because they, they don't have the ability to, to leave the hot environment themselves. Uh, different uh, effects on population depending on their race, their ethnicity, um, which is this intersection between sort of societal, uh, you know, health uh, systems that maybe don't take it to, into account as seriously presented symptoms from a, a minority. Uh, poverty, people who don't have the same resources to address a climate-related health event, which is uh, related to, you know, their housing or their infrastructure, uh, education, all these things are relevant for um, uh, how these climate uh, drivers will lead to changes in actual health on the ground. Um, and this uh, particular chart comes from a, a climate and health assessment in the US um, that came out in 2016. So it is now seven years old and it's US focused, but I think this is one of the the best assessments of its kind that I'm um, familiar with. And so there's a chapter on each of the key climate drivers. So there's a chapter on heat and extreme events, on air quality, on vector-borne diseases, on waterborne illness, uh, on uh, mental health, on populations of concern. And so you can really get in depth to this sort of link between climate drivers, climate exposures, climate impacts, and these modifiers. Um, so each of these drivers has multiple ways that they can uh, have effects. So we have, you know, extreme heat. I mentioned these heat islands. You also have reductions in extreme cold that you can also, there are some benefits to climate change. They're far outweighed by the negative effects, uh, but they are there and they're uh, taken into account in this assessment. Um, for extreme events, you have changes in uh, hurricanes, especially the the most uh, potent hurricanes are expected to increase in severity, uh, changes in how fast the hurricanes move, changes in the precipitation from these hurricanes. Uh, those are all important. Um, flooding from precipitation, uh, changes in drought. Uh, and unfortunately, with climate change, you can actually have both increases in drought and increases in flooding uh, because there's this uh, tendency for your precipitation to get concentrated in the most extreme events but become more sporadic over time. Um, there are a lot of climate effects on air quality. 
wildfires are expected to increase, especially in the the Western U.S. Uh, and uh, Western Canada. Um, and these wildfires uh, increase particulate pollution over large areas. Um, you have changes in stagnation events. Um, ozone events are often associated with these uh, sort of high temperatures, and that's just going to become worse over time. Um, aeroallergens, uh, I'm in DC, we've had a very bad spring in terms of, of allergens, and that's partially because of the lack of cold in the winter. Uh, it's partially because increased carbon dioxide concentrations lead to more um, production of these allergenic um, molecules in these uh, allergy related plants. And then there's uh, sometimes um, some sort of local diseases. Uh, I worked on a, a study on valley fever, which is this fungal uh, disease that you find in the soils in the southwest, and I think maybe northern Mexico, uh, that uh, is then um, infects especially agriculture workers when the soil dries out and these uh this fungus is aerosolized and with climate change we expect the area where this valley fever uh is prevalent to expand uh east and north and so that's that's relevant we mentioned vector-borne diseases so mosquitoes ticks and it's both when the vector-borne diseases become prevalent it's going to be earlier in the spring later in the fall and what ranges it covers uh, and then water related illnesses um, increased precipitation means increased runoff um, you get harmful algal blooms uh, with high temperature waters um, will be happening more and uh, in locations that are further north or south, depending on which hemisphere you're in. So these are all these key drivers and all the things that one could pay attention to when thinking about climate and health. So I was going to ask a question on uh, which of these climate uh, impact categories most uh, worries the people on this call. Is it, you know, these extreme heat events? Is it uh, hurricanes and floods and droughts? Is it changes in air quality from wildfires and stagnation events and allergies? Uh, Vector-borne diseases uh, from changes in uh, mosquitoes and ticks. Uh, we're talking Lyme disease, malaria, uh, Zika. Um, uh, dengue and uh, chikungunya, uh, water-related illnesses from uh, these harmful algal blooms and uh, vibrio um, infecting like oysters and other shellfish, or are there other things that people are worried about? And if so, you know, you could put those in the chat to to talk with with other people. Okay, so this is uh, this is interesting. So we see that uh, people are most worried about extreme events, these sort of changes in hurricanes and floods, and uh, and this may be even related to sea level rise if you're on the coast, because that makes more more local flooding, and that's definitely uh, one of the the big impact categories that climate change is expected uh, to change in the future. But we also see that people are worried about extreme heat. Of course, that's one of the the most direct effects of climate change. Is, is, is increase in warming. That's why it's it's global warming. Uh, we see people are worried about these vector-borne diseases. Um, so yes, people will have to continue to, to work on local uh, control of mosquitoes and of the, the hosts and, and ways to protect yourself or or look at ways to come up with new treatments for some of these, these vector-borne diseases. So these are all important and uh, relevant to climate. So, um, Hi, Marcus. Sorry, five minutes. Thank you. So I wanted to quickly go through one study that we've done to sort of give an example of how one would do an analysis of climate on health. So uh, usually most of these analyses will start with the global climate models, for example, from the CMIP, uh, the IPCC um, Climate Modeling Archive. Uh, and these are will be you know several different RCPs or SSPs, but usually the uh, the resolution isn't good enough from these models. So you need to do some kind of downscaling, either statistical or dynamic, to get 
uh, and, and bias correction to sort of get the local changes that you care about. And then that has to be run through an impact model. In this case, uh, we have an atmospheric chemistry model, a CMAC, that we use in the US. And that will get you to your actual sort of exposure change of the change in air quality. And then that needs to be run through a health impact model. And we use the BenMap model in the US, but uh, we're working on developing a global BenMap model that will be usable for anybody around the world to, to transform air quality changes into to health effects. And then if you want to talk about the economic impacts, you need to value that. So we have a value of a statistical life for a death, or you have um, impacts on hospitalizations or lost labor hours or other things that are the morbidity effects. Uh, but the problem with this uh, analysis is that it's limited to the RCP scenarios that exist, and it's uh, very time consuming. This sort of analysis would take uh, many months to do. So one of the things that my group has been working on is doing these reduced complexity damage models. So we will run our impact models at various different degrees of warming and uh, sort of estimate the health impacts from that. And then once we've done that, once we've made this reduced dim form damage function, you can then use a reduced complexity model like the FAIR model or the MAGIC model, uh, estimate the temperature change from any future scenario, um, and then estimate your future impacts on mortality and monetized damages. This is our Freddy model. And we find this to be a very useful technique when you want to look at the benefits for specific policies or things that are not in uh, the usual uh, RCP archive. So some of the challenges, um, uncertainties tend to be largest for small spatial and temporal scales. This is why we do this downscaling, um, which is important, but it's hard. So that's an important thing. And then it's just so many different interacting effects. So for example, a hypothetical hospital in the coast of Georgia, they have to think about how future heat waves will change hospital admissions in terms of hypothermia. They have to think about uh, storm surges and sea level rise and hurricanes and what that might mean for direct damage to their hospital. Uh, power outages. Um, uh, there's this really interesting work about how sea level rise um, leads to local flooding and that changes the ability for emergency vehicles to reach uh, people who have heart attacks or strokes in that uh, in really important golden hour for uh, treatment where you can really reduce the, the worst effects if you get to people quickly. And so traffic delays from floods that are just happening on a sunny day because of high tides can really have these impacts. Um, I talked about allergy season, uh, red tide exposure is moving north. Uh, so all of these effects are important and they can all affect this just one hospital. So, so this is sort of these all these complicated interacting effects that people have to care about. So uh, in terms of economic valuation, um, I work a lot on the mitigation side. And so for us, often the most important effects are these mortality effects because the value of a life is so large that, that sort of outweighs everything else. But if you're a local planner, you care about these, you know, uh, what are the increased costs of hospitalization? What's the cost of adaptation for these air conditioning and local cooling centers and all of that? Um, and so a better understanding of what options are out there, the benefits, the costs, the barriers to implementing some of these key adaptation measures is important. And thinking about what of these sort of adaptation measures are just general resiliency improvements that they help even if we don't have climate change. A lot of these things were often not well prepared for the already existing climate. So let's improve our preparedness for that and that will help with preparing for the future. Um, and pay attention to these different populations by age, by race, by income, by language. Um, uh, pregnant people, uh, people who have existing disabilities. So uh, with that, here are some of the resources I've talked about. So the climate and health assessment. Uh, uh, I, my group does this a lot of work from this uh, climate impacts and risk assessment, our national climate assessment. One came out in 2018 and had a health chapter. Another one should be coming out this fall. And at the global level, of course, the IPCC assessment, their health chapter. Um, the Climate Impact Lab in Chicago has been doing a lot of great work. Uh, so here are these great resources. Uh, and then here's just some of the 
papers I've cited uh, during this talk that I've worked on, um, if you want to get into more depth than any of those. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Dr. Stiverman, for a great presentation. So now I'll be passing it on to uh, Dr. Montira Pongsiri, um, and she is the Senior Advisor on Climate Change and Health at Save the Children. She was the first science advisor at the U.S. Mission to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in Jakarta, Indonesia, where she led the mission's efforts to work with member states to apply science and technology to support the group's sustainability goals and to strengthen the capacity of science-based policy right, policymaking. She was also an environmental health scientist at the US EPA Office of Research and Development, where she developed and led research initiatives on biodiversity and human health, which studied the links between anthropogenic stressors, changes in biodiversity, and infectious disease transmission. Um, yeah, so now I'll hand it over to you, Montira. Uh, thank you very much. Anwar, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you and Pajo and Columbia for the invitation to join you today. I'm learning a lot already from my wonderful fellow panelists. As you know, climate change has the potential to disrupt the progress of humanity because it affects the provision of our food, safe water, and clean air on which we depend, and because of its potential to exacerbate already existing socially mediated risks such as displacement and limited access to essential health services. I think we all have a common interest in mobilizing science for impact through informed decision-making, policy, advocacy, and solutions on the ground. I think how we do this is important for achieving that impact. What I'm going to do today is to share how we at Save the Children are addressing climate and health using a systems-based approach, how this is operationalized, and then share a few examples of the health benefits of taking action for climate resilience. Next slide, please. In Save the Children's work, addressing the health impacts of climate change is critical because climate adaptation and mitigation by planning by countries cannot ignore health. Doing so could result in unintended consequences which could ultimately undermine our well-intentioned efforts to improve health. Climate change increases inequities in the present and for future generations. The risks to health posed by climate change are the product of the nature of the hazard, whether it's extreme heat, drought, or floods, the extent of exposure to that hazard, and underlying vulnerability, which depends on factors such as existing health status, socioeconomic status, and access to health services. These vulnerability factors are compounded by social determinants such as inequalities associated with sociocultural factors, including gender norms, roles and relations, race, ethnicity, and disability. For Save the Children, climate and health is a climate, health, and equity challenge. Next slide, please. Inequality increases the exposure of disadvantaged groups to the adverse effects of climate change. Inequality increases disadvantaged groups' susceptibility to these adverse effects, and it decreases groups' relative ability to cope with and recover from the harms they suffer. So we're very interested in understanding who is affected, how and why, what are the types of adaptation interventions which can strengthen our ability to track, anticipate, prepare for, and manage climate-related health risks. Next slide, please. The magnitude of climate-sensitive health impacts depends on the climate actions taken now. There is urgency. This figure shows that climate change interacts with social stressors to affect health. Some of these social stressors are modifiable, such as socioeconomic status, access to health services, and housing conditions. And so they can be targets for intervention. Accelerating and amplifying efforts to address the social determinants of health can reduce climate impacts on health. So climate adaptation strategies should focus on practical approaches to effectively sequence and layer interventions that address the range of context-specific factors contributing to adverse health outcomes. 
from the upstream drivers such as climate change and increased exposure to hazards to the underlying structural inequities, unequal access to infrastructure and services, to the more immediate consequences of increasing access on scarce natural resources, for example, conflict and displacement. Next slide, please. Many determinants of health fall outside of the health sector's responsibilities, such as activities in energy, transport, and agriculture, as you've heard. These activities contribute to climate change and at the same time affect health. The relationship between climate change and health can be nonlinear. They can involve time delays and feedback interventions among many factors. And this complexity can lead to health outcomes that are, which are hard to predict and result in unintended consequences, including disproportionate adverse effects on underprivileged groups such as children and women. So as a result, we need have to address the climate and health challenge holistically by taking a systems-based, multi-sectoral approach to consider the many factors and interactions that contribute to or are affected by climate change. A systems approach to climate and health helps us to see the big picture and understand interconnections between drivers of climate change, their impacts, and any feedback relationships which could amplify negative impacts on health. These interconnections are important for identifying root causes rather than symptoms, root causes that we can target for positive change while minimizing the potential for adverse consequences. The key, as you've heard, to operationalizing a systems approach to climate and health is the integration of knowledge on climate, its health impacts, social, and other sectoral determinants which can affect this relationship. Next slide, please. Specifically, we need to integrate these data from across sectors and disciplines into policy tools to support uses such as assessing vulnerability, to support routine monitoring, forecasting, and taking cost-effective actions. This table shows the known decision-making needs and gaps which we have to address for climate action. These were identified with colleagues from academia, UNEP, UNDP, and other practitioners. Next slide, please. At Save the Children, we're operationalizing a systems-based approach to climate and health. First, we have to do more than improve health. We have to sustain health, recognizing that health depends on the state of our natural system, such as the climate. Another objective is to target those climate drivers and the social determinants of ill health that drive health inequity. And last, we want to support multi-sectoral governance that is inclusive of community engagement. Next slide, please. Through our activities, we have to contribute to the evidence base to inform effective adaptation strategies. Research and learning questions are for us are central to the design, how we partner on, implement, and evaluate programming across different health thematic areas, whether it's health and nutrition, infectious disease risk, or maternal and childborn, maternal and newborn health. These questions include, what are the multi-sectoral impacts of climate change, the causal pathways by which this happens, and how do social determinants contribute to climate-driven health impacts? What are the effective social and behavioral strategies for reducing climate-sensitive health risks? What are the good models or best practice on community engagement and what are the enabling conditions for multi-sectoral collaboration that is inclusive of community engagement? Next slide, please. So these, these are the impacts that we're aiming for. Stronger health systems with the capacity to track and respond to climate hazards and changes to risks in health. We wanna support communities with the capacity to prioritize the climate risk impacting their health. And we want to support national and subnational plans which reflect an understanding of climate and health relationships to help guide action. And through all this, we want to elevate the, the voices of children, women, and other disadvantaged groups in advocacy and policy discussions at multiple levels. Next slide, please. So how do we get there? There are five key barriers to addressing climate, health, and equity together. We developed an organization-wide 
strategy and programming to overcome these barriers. For example, to overcome limited awareness that there are common drivers of climate change and of human health. We are improving understanding of the multi-sectoral impacts of and interconnections between human activities, climate and health, as well as the social determinants which contribute to it. To overcome inadequate recognition of the co-benefits of action on climate and health, we're fostering community actions to identify and test interventions. And to break through decision-making silos, we're supporting multi-sectoral governance with the use and application of integrated data and decision support tools, which can facilitate interaction and information sharing across relevant ministries and sectors. To increase the participation of communities, we're strengthening skills and leadership capacity to engage in the co-design and co-implementation of actions. And last, to overcome limited resources, both human and financial, we're developing multiple benefits-based advocacy to engage the public and private sectors. Next slide, please. These are a few examples of our ongoing climate and health activities. In Lao PDR, we're working with the WHO and the government's Ministry of Health and Ministry of the Environment to produce early warnings of dengue and diarrheal diseases. I'll go into detail on this on the next slide. In Colombia, Somalia, and Vietnam, we're building community-based systems maps of climate, health, and equity interconnections. And this will help build a shared understanding of climate and health interconnections so that we can help identify potential interventions for positive change while minimizing the potential for adverse consequences. We're starting with this system's understanding illustrated in a mapping tool, which we dealt with, developed further with the application of the methodology presented by Dr. Bassi to estimate the costs and the health benefits of interventions to address climate-related health risks. Next slide, please. Now with the government of Laos and other partners, Save the Children developed a Green Climate Fund project, which will support the government to increase the climate resilience of the health system at a local level, focusing on 100 health facilities in 2025, I should say climate vulnerable rural districts to be able to address and manage dengue and diarrheal diseases. To this end, the project will work at national and local levels in multiple but interrelated activities. The project will strengthen leadership and governance within the health system, it will integrate climate and health information so the health system can track and manage climate-related risk to health. It will also upgrade the infrastructure in 79 of those facilities. And then finally, through risk communication, and community engagement approaches, the, the project will enable 250 communities to better respond to early warnings, manage risk to health, and to seek care appropriately. Now, as part of this project development, Dr. Bossi work, worked with us to carry out an assessment of the health co benefits of interventions to make health systems in Laos more climate resilient. This assess assessment took the form of an integrated cost benefit analysis, or CBA. The analysis was broad going beyond traditional CBAs, accounting, excuse me, accounting for the direct, which traditionally would account for the direct costs and benefits. But we've gone beyond that to capture the full range of outcomes resulting from implementing an intervention at a single health facility. The integrated CBA included costs of investments in the operation, in maintenance, and also an economic valuation of indirect outcomes. These outcomes include tangible avoided costs of having to buy clean water or electricity, for example, from installing a photovoltaic system. These outcomes also include the intangible avoided costs of mortality, for example, related to extended power outages. The avoided costs of mortality included associated healthcare costs avoided lost productivity and income from a healthy working person. These avoided costs represent what might be called societal benefits among the multiple benefits that the project could generate. 
For the CBA, we considered investments in the adoption of interventions for one health facility with a fixed lifetime of the investment. Seven investments were analyzed, which is on the slide here. They were analyzed for their likely input impacts of the project as designed. In green are the investments which were found to be especially economically viable. For two investments, general health system strengthening and photovoltaic installation, the values of the societal benefits were significantly graded, greater than the investment in and revenues created by them. These reflect the importance of considering the societal impacts of investments in addition to the direct economic benefits they generate. Next slide, please. Pardon, Montero, you have four minutes left. Thank you. So I wanted to end with uh, sharing with you a new global call for climate and health case studies for policy action. Save the Children is working with the Inter-Academy Partnership. This is the global network of national academies of sciences to produce a peer-reviewed collection of case studies to directly inform policy actions and interventions, especially in low and middle income countries. Please share this call with your colleagues and networks, and please consider submitting abstracts uh, yourself. Um, and the deadline is the end of May. Thanks so much for your attention. I look forward to questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Montier. Very interesting presentation. Um, so yeah, first of all, I just wanted to give a round of presentation. Thank you to all our great speakers from today. Now we'll just go through some quick uh, Q&A questions provided by the audience. Um, so the first one is for, for Dr. Andrea Bassi. Um, and I think you've elaborated a little bit on this already in the Q&A session, but just to reiterate, uh, the question is, you know, are there guidelines on how a city should go about choosing the right tree species? Um, for example, the, the example given is that trees being planted are, are doing very poorly now that the city uh, might not want to keep investing in this. Yes, so, so the, the question is very valid. I'm not actually aware of any specific guide, but I've worked on a few projects in Belgium for Addis Abeba, in Pakistan for Islamabad, where we tested with models simulations of the impact of using different trees. And in that case, or types of species of trees and vegetation. And in that case, we looked at um, suitability in terms of climate, in terms of soil. So while I'm not aware of the actual guidance documents, these are the type of parameters that we used. And we put equal emphasis on the maintenance effort. So what happens after the trees are being planted? So that was very, very important. In the case of Addis Ababa in certain areas, tree mortality was up 80%, but it was mostly because of the lack of maintenance or careful maintenance, let's say, in the months and years after the trees were planted. So I'm sorry I cannot help more and point to a specific source, but these are the type of parameters I've considered in previous work. Thank you very much, Andrea. Our next question is for Diego Heredia. I'll go ahead and ask it in Spanish as it was originally posed. Y la pregunta es um, sobre las plataformas The que question usa. asks about the platforms you used for the project conducted in Colombia. These platforms and tools, um, are they free access tools or how difficult was it for you to access these tools and also which were the costs uh, related to the application. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anwar. Um, so this was part of an agreement we had with uh, WHO and one of the people that designed the carbon age tool, Joseph Spadaro, was the one that, uh, you know, calculated everything. This means that we did we didn't have access to the platform. He did this himself um, using his own platform. As a country, we provided the data, and we participated in its analysis, but we mainly provided the input data. 
However, at WHO, you can find the guides. And there you can, of course, uh, contact the authors so that you can, you know, find out if this tool can be downloaded or, or accessed. Um, in this particular case, for this project, this was a, um, a WHO uh, collaboration uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust. Thank you very much, Diego. To, to a few others. So, so for for uh, Dr. Marcus Sarafem, um, if you could just give a a one to two minutes reflection on if there's any closing ideas that you really want the audience to take with them, what what would those be? Um. I would say the the two things are one is an analysis question. I think the importance of uh, finding a good downscaling approach to do your local climate effects and ways to then make that a reduced complexity analysis that you can do over and over. And the other one I think is very much uh, what Montira was talking about, the importance of thinking about uh, vulnerable populations and taking those into account in both your analysis and in your policy design. Thank you. Um, now I'll pose the same question uh, to you, Dr. Pong Siri. Um, just if there's any big ideas, big closing messages that you really want the audience to take to heart with them today. Thanks, Anwar. I guess I would like to uh, just note that um, I think how you conceptualize the the climate and health problem uh, determines how you address it. So, you know, for obvious reasons that save the children, we've we've defined climate and health as a climate health and equity challenge. So we try to not only build up the evidence base uh, of how and why certain disadvantaged groups are more affected um, and the causal mechanisms by which that happens, but at the same time, this is all to the end of really trying to design and implement effective interventions in context. Um, so number one, how you define the problem uh, affects how you will approach it with partners. And the need to engage communities um, is really important. Uh, and how you do it particularly is really, really important to keep them not only involved, um, but also very active in the co-design and the co-implementation of the solutions that are context specific. So they are sustained over time. Thank you. Thank you. And as we have a little bit of more time left, I'll go ahead and pose the same to, to Dr. Andrea Bassi. There's a big idea, a big important theme that you want to, to be, be carried with our audience today. What would that be? Uh, to me, that would be to integrate health in any sort of decision making. So making sure that whatever the entry point is, there is a health angle to that, because it, it just brings up the core benefits that this creates for society. So it would be a missed opportunity not to take that into account. Thank you. And now with our last few moments, I'll present this to Dr. Diego Moreno Heredia. I'll say it in Spanish. So, por último, um, también. Finally, uh, same question, um, Dr. Diego Moreno Heredia. So which would which is the main takeaway uh, today for our audience? I think we need to act now. Governments need to act now, given uh, how it is co-responsible together with companies and citizens. We need to act now because we realize now that the effects are very clear. We don't need to estimate costs uh, because we can see them, actually, the diseases, um, climate sensitive diseases mainly. However, these, these costs and co-benefit estimation provides us with a further argument so that we can tell governments and every sector that we need to make decisions now and that we need to create, uh, to develop serious policies in order to look after people's health and people's lives, 
when it comes to the impacts of climate change and climate variability. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Diego. Thank you all very much for joining and for your interest in the subject. Um, so be sure to tune in next Tuesday. We have the next session and the topic is opportunities and guidance for lowering the carbon footprint of health systems. Um, so yeah, thank you all to everyone and we hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks again to our excellent speakers and our great interpretations team.